Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and especially my host, Cadilla Pharmaceuticals. Now, you have to wonder when you're, uh, uh, when you're doing studies, how do you dose vitamin D? There's been a, a lot of different ways. You've had daily dosing, weekly dosing, monthly dosing, bi-monthly dosing, yearly dosing, which is totally insane. Most of these aimed at skeletal homeostasis. Um, we started, we, we always thought daily would be the best for maintaining stable levels. Uh, weekly was, was, was okay, but beyond that, it, there are problems, okay? You don't take your blood pressure medicine once a month. You don't take most of your meds once a month. And so why would you dose vitamin D once a month? Um, and the answer is you shouldn't do that. Most of it is, again, based on skeletal studies. So we wrote this paper in 2013 because we were recognizing that there was a lot of diversity in studies, some being positive, some being negative. Ba basically the same studies. The only difference was how they were administering vitamin D. So we, we wrote this paper in JCNM. It's quite detailed. And we tried to explain why this would happen. And this, met, this paper met with great resistance in the field because it invalidated a lot of studies that had been published and, and, and taken as fact. The slide's very, um, very involved, but I, it just p pay attention here that vitamin D, the compound that you take in calcitrol here, uh, or, or calcitrol, is a vitamin D, it's a parent compound. It's metabolized then to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, the one that we're all familiar with that we physicians measure to see if you have enough vitamin D. And further on, it's metabolized to 125, which is the hormonal form. You'll notice that these compounds have drastically different half-lives in the body. Vitamin D is, is, is three weeks. The other ones are, are a day to hours. And this, has, uh, pro this is very important because 25-D is a stable form, and, and this participates largely in the endocrine system of skeletal homeostasis that we all know. This is what we are all taught. What we weren't taught, is relatively new, is the function of vitamin D and the pericrine and intercrine function, where vitamin D has to diffuse into cells and is metabolized and, and, and acts at site. Does it go back into the circulation? This happens in almost every cell in the body, okay? And to make this happen, you need vitamin D because it's liposoluble, it's not held on a protein, and it's available to go in and out of cells by, just by diffusion. And when it does that, it can be activated all the way through the cycle to have the hormonal effect within the, the cell itself. I extremely important concept. Why does dosing matter? Because on, on monthly or every other month or yearly dosing, this compound goes up and down and is gone, okay? So it's, it's, it's absent. And we think that that's uh, not a good thing. So n vitamin D is not only functioning in bone, it also functions in the integrity of muscle homeostasis separately. Oftentimes in vitamin D deficiency, along with the bone problems, you have soreness and muscle weakness. They're separate issues, okay? The muscle weakness is not due to the bone issues. The muscle weakness or lack of healing is due to its own issues. And vitamin D is a very potent uh, stimulator of, of genes that have an effect on, on building muscle tissue. So um, it's very important in muscle homeostasis as well. Now, uh, I'll come back to the fact of this study, vitamin D is administered um, to elderly people to stop falls and uh, basically in, in, in improve skeletal integrity. This paper was published in, in JAMA recently and it was very telling in that what happened is on a monthly dose, of, a large monthly dose was actually harmful. Those people fell down more than, if, than, than people taking less. So, 
again, bolus dosing, even in skeleton, has its risks. Uh, how does vitamin D prevent infections, which is, which is quite good at doing? This paper was we published in 2006 in Science. I was one of about, what, 25 authors on this paper. It's a remarkable paper. This paper's been cited about 3,000 times. It's about how vitamin D activates the, the, uh, the uh, antimicrobial peptides and kills viruses and bacteria. Uh, uh, and in this particular case, it was aimed at tuberculosis. Now, I'll come back to Dr. Martineau here, um, who just published this in Britical, British Medical Journal, and it has to do with how dosing, again, affects infection rates. And this is uh, the acute respiratory tract infections. So he assembled all these trials, met and did a meta-analysis, and what did he find? Um, bolus dosing, right here. So, you look at how it was dosed. If you dose bolusly to prevent infections, it fails, which I'm sure shocked him because he was a proponent of, of these bolus dosings. As opposed to daily or weekly dosings, it's highly effective at preventing um, respiratory infection. That's a pretty good way of, of avoiding colds or eliminating colds is simply be have adequate vitamin D. And it also explains the diversity of the studies, or some studies worked and some studies didn't. It, it, it helps the confusion that we have seen simply, again, by the dosing. How about cardiovascular and vitamin D? Uh, it's less clear because there's been less studies. I personally feel that it's a... Uh, that it's an advantage. Uh, this was some uh, study by Dobnig a, a few years back showing all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality based on circulating 25D levels where uh, Quattaro 4 here is the highest level and this is the most efficient level and you can see that these are nicely separated so there's something going on here. Either vitamin D is preventing or helping cardiac disease or cardiac disease is somehow lowering vitamin D levels and that's what the skeptics always say it's called reverse causation but I fail to see how reverse causation can be associated with every single disease that we see with vitamin D and um, and I just think it's baloney so the, the cardiac risk factors that you see uh, um, in, in cardiac disease, of course, we all know hypertension's bad, puts you at risk. Cigarette use is bad, although there's never been a randomized controlled trial in cigarette use, we just know that it, it's bad by epidemiologic evidence. Diabetes is bad. Cholesterol, for whatever reason, is, is, a, is a risk factor. LDL cholesterol is a risk factor. HDL cholesterol is a protective factor. Aspirin use is a protective factor, and lo and behold, circulating 25 is, is really a potent. Now, what, how, how would this be? Uh, remember, it's an anti-inflammatory compound. Uh, everybody in here takes statins, or most people take statins. Okay, how do you think statins work? Of course, it lowers cholesterol, right? That's what it was designed to do. Do you really think that that's how it prevents heart disease? It doesn't. It's a strong anti-inflammatory agent. That was a side product. That's not what they anticipated, and it's probably how statins function at it, it, it lowering cardiac risk, not through the cholesterol lowering, through the inflammation and scarring potential that happens from the inflammation. Same thing that vitamin D would do. Blood pressure, uh, just to say we did a randomized trial and we could show that escalating doses of vitamin D will lower blood pressure, which is, of course, another risk factor. It's not a big reduction, but it's a significant reduction that can aid in whatever hypertensive you may be taking and, and possibly could aid in eliminating some of the hypertensive that you prescribe to your patients. They wouldn't need as much. In diabetes, 
Uh, again, not a whole lot of data, but there is suggestive data. Uh, this is from Scandinavia when they, in, when children is type 1 diabetes autoimmune, when they used to give a lot of vitamin D to infants. I mean, this is really a lot, 4,500 to an to a infant, but that's what they did. And then through the years, because of U.S. recommendations, they kept going down, 1,000, and then finally in 92 to 400, and look at the incidence of the type 1 diabetes that happened in relation to this, highly suggestive about uh, uh, the relationship between um, autoimmune disease and vitamin D. Another paper that was just published in India that is, is positive for the effects of vitamin D on type 2 diabetes. 